Have you ever seen one of those movies where the camera starts out, say, I don't know, zoomed in at the atomic level, they're showing electrons flowing around a, a nucleus and so forth, and the camera backs out and it shows the molecules, and then it backs out and it shows the compounds, and it backs out, and then and it starts backing out, and, and you get to a point where you see all sorts of things that are made from these atoms, right? Well, that's kind of what we're going to do today. We have spent the past number of lessons talking about, well, the components, the molecules, so to speak, of the computer. We've talked about uh, gates and switches and, and, and logic circuits and memory circuits and so forth. Now, when you back out, what you end up seeing is the architecture of the system. Hey, let's go ahead and use that as the example. Whenever you think of a building, you know, you kind of get an idea of, for example, the difference between a home and a grocery store and say a college, you know, a, an education building, an academic building. Um, each one designed by an architect to create a space around people, right? As create a space for people to live in, to participate in. And each one of those spaces, well, they have very special purposes. For example, you probably don't have urinals in your bathrooms in your home, right? Because that's not the kind of use that you would expect in a, uh, in a home bathroom. But whenever you look at the bathrooms in an academic building where they expect to have large numbers of students between classes needing to have a break, well, you're gonna have a very different design. But yet, the bricks, the cinder blocks, the paint, and so forth that is used to create a home is very similar to the pieces. Well, you may have steel girders instead of, uh, you know, instead of wooden studs. But, you know, the, the idea is, is that the architect has an idea of the use of the building, how they want things to flow, how they want people to live and use that building. But the components, the, the, the actual things, the materials that we build the, the building with, that is equivalent to the gates and the circuitry that we've been doing with this computer organization up to this part. So net point. So now what we're going to do is address something called computer architecture. <clears throat> and this is what we have, well, <clears throat> we've been building up to this point where we can build a building. Now we need to design the building. Now, one of the most important parts about computer architecture is how you communicate with memory. And we're going to start with something called a flat memory space. Now, a flat memory space is the very simplest way for a computer, for a processor to interact with memory. Um, and in fact, let's take a little break and, and show you a basic, well, it's this, this thing called the memory hierarchy. And the memory hierarchy is comp composed of multiple levels where we've got these different components of memory or different places where we can store values. Now at the very top, we've got, well, the processor is sitting up here at the very top. Now included in the processor is something called registers. Now, registers are just groups of those D flip-flops, remember? And so you've got the D flip-flops that are storing values, and you put a bunch of them together, you can store a larger number. Think of it as like a scratch pad memory. So you just need to jot down some notes to remember what you're working on. In fact, maybe a better example of this might be if you've got one of those old style calculators where you just have a single screen, you know, just that one single screen displaying a number. And so you're doing all of your operations. That number that's being displayed on the screen, that's stored in something called a register. It's basically just displaying the contents of the register. So all the processing, all the computing, all the right now real-time operations that are going on are occurring inside of these registers 
Unfortunately, we can't store everything that we're working on in registers. So we need to have something that's really fast, a memory that's really fast, but kind of close by. And um, that's that's still, it's still gonna be inside the processor. And it, it's gotta be incredibly fast. That's where we have at this next level, what we call a cache or a RAM cache. And so the processor, and in fact, a lot of the times, the processor itself contains some of the cache. There may actually be some cache that is just outside the processor. For example, if I've got a multi-core system, if I've got multiple CPUs on a, single, on a single chip, it may be that each one has one of its own like kind of really close by caches, and then, it had, then everybody shares a, a cache that's a little larger, but a little further out that they can share. And that might be what's called an L1 and an L2 cache. An L1 cache is the one that's inside the processor. L2 cache, that's the one that everybody kind of shares. Yeah, we have different levels. Anyway, so you've got these caches. Now, sitting outside the cache, you have main memory. Sometimes people call this RAM. RAM is not really the correct term for it because RAM actually means random access memory. And in fact, it has a lot to do with this idea of a flat memory space that we're gonna talk about in the next lesson. Um, but that's where you're storing, well, pretty much all the active processes we're currently working on. So for example, if you're running a browser, the certain pieces of software that are active with that browser, that, that you're using with that browser software, that's gonna be loaded into main memory. Think of it this way. If I have a long piece of code, the piece of code that I'm executing is contained in main memory, but the for loop that I'm currently inside of, the, the code that I'm currently executing, that may be in the cache, and then the actual instruction, the actual data that I'm working on, those would be in the registers. Now. We have to have a place to store everything long term. And in fact, if the machine shuts off, we need to be guaranteed that there's going to be some memory that's kept you know, accurate. And that's going to be your long term storage that is at the bottom of the pyramid. And this can include a number of things. It can include SSDs, solid state drives, it can HHDs, hard, you know, the hard disk, or excuse me, HDD, the hard disk drives. Um, but it can also include things like um, your optical drives. It can include things like tape drives. Yes, tape is still used, believe it or not, because of its long-term store, its capabilities in long-term storage. So let's do another analogy. I grew up in a home where my mother was, well, my mother's a very good cook. And, um, you know, we used to have a, a lot of food in the house. Uh, she would can, she would do, so there, our house was filled with lots of good food. But, you know, as a teenage boy, you know, all teenage boys, we've got an appetite, right? And so we're constantly eating. And let's say that, you know, this teenage boy who used to go through, well, not the teenage boy I used to be, past Dave. Let's say that, uh, well, I went through a lot of milk, okay? Now, I could, if I had, say, a bowl of cereal or something, I would, where would I first check to see if we had milk? Well, the very first place I'd check to see if we had milk was, well, the refrigerator in the kitchen, right? And so the very first thing you do is you, you just, you know, you pour your bowl of cereal, you go to the refrigerator, you open the refrigerator, you take a look there, is what I need in that refrigerator? Am I looking in the registers, so to speak, for my milk? If it's not there, where do I go? Well, we had a couple of refrigerators in the basement too. And so if I didn't find any milk in there, and mom knew, of course, she was raising a teenage boy, so she would have plenty of gallons of milk in the house. So I would go downstairs and check in the basement to see if the basement refrigerators had it. I would go to the cache and see if the cache was, was containing it. Why didn't I go to the cache first? Well, the reason I didn't go to the cache first was because, well, it was farther away. It would have taken longer. I'm hungry, right? And so... The fact is, is that the cache is further away, but since the cache, and go with me here, 
I had a couple of refrigerators in the basement. Since the cache is larger, there was a greater chance that it was going to be contained in the cache, that milk was going to be contained in the cache, than it was possible for it to be contained in the smaller upstairs refrigerator. Okay. Also, we were kind of actively, I mean, it's, let's put it this way. So the farther away from where my cereal is, the slower, the longer it takes to find the milk. But the farther away I get, the more chance I'm going to find the milk. So next place I'm going to look. Well, let's say that I really want this cereal, but the basement refrigerator didn't have any milk either. Or it went bad, I don't know. Where would I go next? Well, if I'm really desperate, I would go to the convenience store at the corner, right? I would get on my bike or whatever, or, or drive or whatever, and go to the convenience store. Now the convenience store, much larger, much larger. So there's a lot greater chance that what I'm looking for is there. But on the off chance that the convenience store is out of milk, or doesn't carry milk, where would I go next? I'd go to the grocery store, the long-term storage. More than likely, yes, it's going to be there. So if you think about this, this hierarchy, this memory hierarchy, which is what this is called, this is the memory hierarchy. Okay. Now the memory hierarchy, as you get further away from the processor, it is slower takes more time, right? So for example, it may take three uh, nanoseconds to get to the cache, whereas it might take 30 nanoseconds to get to main memory. And then you're talking about maybe three seconds or, or some, something like that in order to get to the long-term memory. So it's slower to get what you're looking for. But the capacity also increases. So as we get closer to the processor, speed improves, but the chances of finding what we're looking for go down. Now there's actually a third component, a third thing, third characteristic that improves as you get farther away from the processor, and that is the cost per bit for storing data goes down. It, the, the cost per bit improves as we get further away. In fact, let's just, let's just look at the last two. Let's look at main memory and long-term storage. Um, you know, we could do a really quick search here. All right, so let's look at some let's look at some memory here. Um, you know, I'm just I'm just grabbing something off of the web. Uh, how about this? We've got a DRAM. Uh, we've got 16 gigabytes for about $270. All right. Now let's look at the same thing for a hard disk drive. And here we go. We've got a three terabyte for for fifty dollars, about fifty dollars. Okay. Now let's take a look and see what the cost per bit is. So if I've got sixteen gigabytes, and and what we'll do is we'll do a cost. Per, we'll do we'll do the cost uh, you know well in fact I've got my 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 fractions wrong here so we're we're actually going to need to invert this so this would be 270 divided by 16 gigabytes so what you're looking at is about about 17 dollars so we'll make this about 17 dollars per gigabyte now. We're going to look at this one. So we've got 3,000 gigabytes for $50. So $50 divided by 3,000. You're looking at about, uh, about, uh, what is it? <laughs> I'm doing really well here. You're looking at about uh, 1.7 cents per gigabyte. All right. 
And in fact, people often talk about the technology that's being used to store something in a RAM cache. Why don't we use the same technology since the RAM caches are so much faster? Why don't we use the same technology that we make a RAM cache with for main memory? Well, this number right here, the $270 for 16 gigabytes, that'd end up being closer to about $1,000 for 16 gigabytes if you tried to use the same technology, the faster technology in the cache as you went down to main memory. So, there you go, a real brief introduction to the memory hierarchy, and what we're looking at is, is once again, we started out small, we're looking at a single memory cell, I mean, our last couple of lessons has been about a single memory cell, and we're going to back our way out and look at it from the architecture point of view. In the next lesson, what we're going to do is we're going to back our way out and take a look at main memory, specifically main memory that's addressed in the flat memory space, and we're going to show how the memory interacts with the process processor and how we can use those same exact, uh, you know, that same exact interface in order to interact with specific hardware. For example, controlling LEDs or motors or something using something called memory mapping.